good evening. Thank you all for coming out, everyone. Okay? Yeah. All right. Um, I'm a little nervous. I don't do this very often. I usually get other people to speak. Um, but also excited. I really wanted to um, explore this topic for a variety of reasons. And one is uh, just my general curiosity. But also, as a, as a museum, you know, of course, our responsibility is collecting and maintaining the history of Carrier County. We don't have as much information about some of the African American communities in the area. And I'm hoping that by starting this conversation, or African American communities in Naples, rather, by starting this conversation, that some of the people who lived these experiences, who were here for it, who know about it, will want to come and talk to us and share their experiences with us. If they have photos, that they will want to come and share those with us. Um, so that's, you know, that's sort of the catalyst for, for this program. Um, we are going to talk about a, a few different com uh, communities. And as I've said, we don't all necessarily have a ton of information about all of these communities. Um, hopefully, you know, if there are people who know more about, about them than what's on here, which I fully expect that there are plenty of people around here who know that, that they will be able to give us a little more information and, and speak to their experiences. All right, are we ready? Yes. All right. All right, so we're gonna actually start with a little bit of early, early, early Southwest Florida. Um, just a little information. So um, we, there are records that show that the, with the arrival of, Span of the Spanish, there were black conquistadors. So, you know, as long as there was a La Florida, there were African or African people, black people, of, or people of African descent coming to La Florida or being a part of it. Um, so we do have records of that as well, you know, as, you know, the, as a, what would become the United States grows and the colonies grow, of course, the chattel slavery is growing. And as that's happening, um, some of those, many of those slaves are running away from these plantations and a lot of them ran into Florida. Now, the reason for that is that Florida was a Spanish territory and um, Spain outlawed chattel slavery well before some of the other countries did. Um, so Florida was not a, a slave territory. And what Spain actually did offer was that if you were a runaway slave and you made it to Florida, you immediately got your freedom if you um, served a certain amount of time in the military, in the Spanish military. So because of that, lots of runaway slaves were coming to Florida as well, you know, because it was a Spanish territory and um, it was governed by Spain, but it wasn't super developed. Um, and so, you know, they could come here and, and some came in intermixed with the Seminoles that had also come here. Some started their own communities. So they could really come here and, and be free. So, um, so that's, some came that way. Um, and so we do, we do have these early people of color, African-Americans, people of African descent who were in Florida well before this time period that we're going to really start talking about. All right, so in 1886, we get the Naples Town Improvement Company. They come here, they want us to be like Naples, Italy. They have all these big plans. They start plotting the area. They sell lots. Um, it sort of takes off. Um, they, they have some financial issues. So, you know, money has, or property has to change hands. Um, and I'm going through this rather quickly so we can actually get to the, the communities. But I'm bringing this up because, oops. Because some of the early arrivals of um, African Americans are tied to the Naples Hotel, the original Naples Hotel, which came about 
Um, I think I saw 18, 1889. And so if you look at this, down here, it said on the, on the map, it says 10, which was the garage is where the colored help lived. Um, now that was actually, once I actually started doing my research, that was not in 1889. So I'm not exactly sure when they started arriving here. Um, most of the things that I saw said the 1920s, a little bit earlier, some things in the teens. So they could have been here, you know, they, but they were coming here as domestic help. And so they had their own quarters here. Um, and 10 is this right here. So that's the garage. And this is a picture of, of what they called the colored quarters, um, which was provided by Dr. Earl Baum. Thank you. It was provided by Dr. Earl Baum, and um, that's a better picture of it, supposedly. And so I'm saying that to say that this is before Baron Collier comes and starts buying up and developing, and more importantly, building the Tamiami Trail. Um, so Baron Collier comes in 1911, but it's 1923 before he starts building the Tamiami Trail. So this happens a little bit before then. Um, but the Tamiami Trail, the building of the Tamiami Trail is what brings more black workers to this area. Okay, they, they need work. He has work available for them. So he's coming down here. He sets um, the county seat as Everglades City, and I am skipping a little Collier County history. Um, but he sets the county seat as Everglade, Everglade, which would eventually become Everglades City. And um, these workers start coming. And so their area there was called DuPont. And if you drive into Everglades City now, and you look to the right as you come in, you'll see DuPont Road. And DuPont was right there by the marina, um, and the manager of that museum is here, so if I get it wrong, please correct me. <laughs> but it was right there by what is now the marina, but it was the black community. But what I've read, some from We Also Came, um, some from other, some other sources, was that Mr. Collier would hire you regardless of color. And it wasn't, a, it wasn't a, you know, if this white male was over here, he got the job first. And then if you couldn't find a white male, then we're gonna find a, a black male. It was, can you do the job? Yes, you're hired. So, um, which was kind of unusual at the time, but also he wasn't from the South either. So that may have a role, but, um, but the DuPont community had their own school. Um, it, from what I read, it was, K, it, it was K through 12, or not K, first through 12. They didn't have kindergarten. Um, but most of the people there were, high, was, were employed in some capacity for the Collier Company. You know, they may not have been workers on the Tamiami Trail, but they may have worked at the laundry or something of, of that sort. And then there was also a meal that he owned and so they would work in that capacity. All right. So there's also Copeland. Now Copeland still exists, of course. You can drive through Copeland. Um, Copeland was a company town. Now Com Copeland, I found out, this was something new. I thought it was founded as a company town. It apparently was not. It was already established. Then when the Tidewater Cypress Company came here to do timber, they looked at Copeland and said, this will be our company town and sort of took it over. Um, so it became company town. It was segregated. So there was a white side and a black side of town. Uh, Miss Perlene Dixon talked this, um, this summer who had, who grew up in Copeland and she had great memories of it. She said pretty much everybody got along. Um, you know, she didn't, she did go away to school um, after a certain age, but you know, she remembers people getting along. But what I found interesting is that the Cypress Company built a church, built two churches, one for the white community, one for the black community. 
but specifically to the black community, every Sunday was a different denomination. So like first Sunday was the Baptist, second Sunday was the Methodist, third Sunday was the Pentecostal. So, and they just had a rotation of preachers who would come each Sunday for whatever denomination. What I couldn't figure out were well, the same people going from, going showing up each Sunday. <laughs> I don't know. But I thought that was really interesting. There was one church, but they rotated denominations. Now, as far as the men were concerned, they all worked for the Tidewater Cypress Company, um, but not necessarily so for the women. Some of them came into town, came into Naples to work. Some of them went into Everglades City to work. You know, they didn't all necessarily, some of them worked in the tomato, on a tomato farm. Um, which I think is in Ochapi. Okay. So I'm still learning. I was still reading, still learning. So, um, but so they weren't all necessarily working for, for the Tidewater Cypress company. Now there was no school in Copeland. So most of them got bused to the DuPont school in Everglades city. And then because for a while there was no high school for blacks in Collier County, they had to go to Lee County to Fort Myers to the Dunbar school there. Um, eventually though, they do get a school in Immokalee and I think they start getting bus to Immokalee for before a school actually gets built in Naples. But I'm assuming from Copeland to Immokalee would be closer than from Copeland to Naples or it might, might be about the same. I don't know. All right, Immokalee. This is probably what I learned the most during my research. Knew nothing about this, had never heard of any of this. So Immokalee had two areas, Cumbers Camp and Bunker Hill, which were essentially across the street from each other. Um, from what I read, Bunker Hill was on the left, Cumbers Camp was on the right. And it was about six miles outside of Immokalee. Um, and it was on a canal. So they were cinder block houses and they were all built up on blocks in case the canal flooded so that they could still, it wouldn't flood out the homes. Bunker Hill was actually like a work camp um, or, you know, it wasn't a full town, so we, we won't call it like a, a company town, but it was built by the company. Um, it was built by James Gant of Ochapi and it was his work camp. So his workers lived there. Um, I didn't get the same thing from Comfort, um, Cumber's camp as to whether or not it was a work camp. Um, but I did read that, you know, people there worked in some capacity for one of either for the meal or for um, one of the tomato fields. So I don't know if it was actually built as a work camp, but the little information I found on it where these were really hardworking people who worked all day in, in hard labor kind of, kind of jobs. Immokalee does get a, um, their own high school for, for blacks and that is the Bethune High School. Um, and it was one through 12. And when they stopped busing kids in Naples to Fort Myers, they bused them to Immokalee for a little while um, until the parents of those kids said, you know, we really like our kids to go to school in Naples. Mm -hmm. And they started working on them having their own high school. Um, something that's kind of unique about Immokalee is that there was more land ownership there. Not so much home ownership, but land ownership. Um, in, in terms of like, you had people who had their own businesses there. I <laughs> uh, had, had um, had blacks who had their own businesses there. So I saw that John Lee owned a dance hall and a store and a bar, you know, and you know, he outright owned them. You know, he was able to purchase that property. Um, a guy named Deacon Mobley owned a grocery store, a lady named Cute Smith, which, you know, you name your child cute, you have really high standards for your child, <laughs> but she owned a beauty shop. So um, that was a little unusual because um, at, once we start talking about McDonald's quarters a little bit or about Naples, there were, even after integration, even after you got to the point where blacks would, were able to 
were able to buy land, people wouldn't sell them land. So here you have an, uh, you know, you have um, something that's a little unique in that here's a community where, you know, some of the blacks there owned a, a ton of land or owned a, quite a bit of land or their own property in, in some way. All right, do we have any questions so far? Because we're about to move into Naples. <coughs> no, we're okay? All right. Did, didn't Mr. Gant own the tomato fields? He did, he did, in Ochapi. All right, Naples. Now, I learned a little, uh, quite a bit about it, about Naples, and you know, we, we focus a lot on McDonald's quarters and we'll probably talk the most about McDonald's quarters, but there were other places that people lived before McDonald's quarters, some that we don't have much information on, and I'm really hoping we can start gathering more information. One of them is Sugar Hill. So um, I went to try to find out where Sugar Hill actually was. It's mentioned, um, and we also came by a few people. Um, the only description I can find is an alley between Palm Pharmacy and, and medical in the medical center. It was east of Hospital. See, this is what I'm talking about. I knew somebody knew. <laughs> so I, I, was this a large community? I couldn't figure no. that out. Because no. when someone says an alley, I'm thinking that can't be very big. It wasn't. Not, not large at all. So I wasn't able to find a lot of information on Sugar Hill other than that people lived there. I don't know why it was called Sugar Hill. That, sand. Oh, it was Sugar like white sand? sand. Yeah. Ah, interesting. And so one of the people in here said, like, she asked her mom why it was called Sugar Hill. And she asked her, was the hills actually made out of sugar when she was a child? So, all right. Oh, what happened? Okay. All right, so Ditch Bank. Now, Ditch Bank is where people lived um, before McDonald's Quarters. Well, they either lived in Ditch Bank or they lived in the Sawmill Quarters, for the most part. Um, Ditch Bank is where Creighton Cove is now. Um, it was, um, it had, it's also where Macedonia Baptist Church or originally was located. And it had its own school, the Ditch Bank School, which was held inside Macedonia Church. Um, so it was the first school for black kids in Carrier County. It wasn't called the Ditch Bank School. It wasn't called that? No. What was it called? Nothing. It was school in the Macedonia Church. Oh, well. Because Ditch Bank is slang. What do you mean? It wasn't a proper name. Oh. It was slang. It was colloquial. Well, I mean, in, in, it probably was slang, but um, it, it appears in, in like all the city records. They Everybody called it Ditch Bank, um, whether or not they actually officially named it that. Um, that's how it was referred to. Um, was it near that canal? The ditch? It ran along it. Yeah, makes sense. You're talking about the Indian Canal. Yeah. Yeah. So the way Ditch Bank would, so Ditch Bank was there, and then you had the sawmill quarters, um, which I hope someone can help me out with this because there were multiple mills and multiple quarters, and I couldn't find which mill built these quarters. But these quarters were specific for the for the black workers that worked at one of the sawmills. And that is where McDonald's quarters was placed. So um, a man by the name of um, Julius McDonald comes and decides that, you know, he wants this land where Ditch Bank is and he wants to develop it. No, no, no. He did not develop Ditch Bank. Benny Morris developed Ditch Bank. Okay. He wanted to build it out and he approached the city about, about getting this land. He wasn't by himself. He did have a partner, but he want, he approached the city wanting to, to build out Ditch Bank into what will become Creighton Cove. He wanted to develop it. Now, what's interesting is in his proposal to the city, what he told them was, you know, the black residents at Ditch Bank and in the sawmill quarters deserve better housing than what they have. And so I'm going to come in and I'm going to build them better housing 
over here where the McDonald's quarters is. That was part of the provision that the city said, if you want this land, you want to develop it, you have to do something about the residents who live there. You have to provide something for them. Now, um, he agreed to that. And he was able to get a permit to build these homes. But if you go back and look at the records, when, the, um, when Herb Cambridge was leading the charge to do something about McDonald's quarters, he could actually find no formal process to get a permit. He just had a permit. We, they don't really know why. You know, we know, you know, maybe he knew someone, maybe he greased the palm or two, I don't know. But somehow he got a permit to build these homes um, what, in what would become McDonald's quarters. Now, these homes were, um, were not so great. They weren't well built. They didn't have a great plan. Um, but more importantly, the area of McDonald's quarters wasn't well planned out. So we're talking about a little less than five acres. And they wanted, he put 99 homes on the property, less than five acres. Though they had lights and they had running water, the sewage um, lines were not attached to anything. So they were not connected to the city. Joy, what year was that? 1949 is when, when McDonald's Quarters um, gets built. So these sewer lines, there were no plans to connect them to the city. So he essentially went and built shacks. Um, though probably better shacks than with the, what they were living in still weren't phenomenal. You know, of course, they had something they didn't have before. They had running water. They had lights. They didn't have those before. Um, but they still didn't have proper sewage. You know, it wasn't, wasn't great. Um, so within two years of him build, starting to build um, McDonald's quarters and people living in them, within two years, the city had declared them deplorable. They had already said two years that this place was not fit for people to live. So we're at what, 1951? I'm gonna try to keep bringing up the date so we can really talk, think about this timeline. So 1951, people live, you know, what is happening? I must be pressing something. Uh-oh, I don't know what I just did. Joy, do you know what Mr. McDonald did? What his business was? Um, I don't. Because uh, the, the only thing I had heard about him was that he lived in Fort Myers. He lived in Fort Myers. I didn't know the contractor. Mm -hmm. he was, was he a contractor? contractor? Okay, he good. Was Thank a you. Renowned builder in Fort Myers. Okay. okay. Yes. Okay. Renowned. Okay. okay. What? Like where McDonald's Quarters was mm -hmm. in relation, like in, in the Wolves, where was that exactly? Yeah. Oh, uh, McDonald's Quarters, um, I tried to go down there and see. It's downtown. Or what we consider by downtown, Park. by what? By the river park. By river, the river park community uh, right. used to be in McDonald's the quarters. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. See, like when people refer to that, I'm always like, I don't know what that is. But yeah. I go, like I've gone down there and kind of driven around, yeah. but I can't really map it. Yeah, because it's go up 10 mm -hmm. before you get to Macedonia. Mm -hmm. Church, there's that jasmine thing. Okay. Right? And that's yeah. where it was. Yeah. The quarters were there. And then we have the church, and then we now have Carter. Mm -hmm. And I was told that Sawmill, Sawmill Quarters was actually south of there, either Central Avenue and Goodlit, mm -hmm. or First Ave South and Goodlit. First Ave South and Goodlit? And it's certainly possible that, you know, what was put into the city records and what actually happened exactly. can be different. Yeah. You know, um, but that's, you know, that's what the record says. Yes. If they didn't have sewer, what was that line going to? Just into another hole in the ground? Well, we're going to get to that. <laughs> yes. Oh, I recognize Dr. Briggs and his wife there. Mm -hmm. To the left. This is a, Mac a picture of Macedonia. No, but that's Dr. Briggs and his wife. Oh, right here on the left. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. So, um, so, you know, Two years, they called it deplorable conditions. Um, 
Nine years later, they were still building in McDonald's quarters when they stopped building because the construction association in Naples said, we're not building any more houses here because these homes are not up to code. The amount of room isn't up to code. We're not building anymore. We, we refuse to. So that's nine years later. So where are we at now? 1960? Okay. So 1960, here comes these people, the, the Builders Association who says, we, we just can't do this anymore. Like, you know, we're not going, we're just not going to continue to build these homes that we know are not up to par. 1960. So Herb Cambridge comes in 1959, I believe. And no, I'm sorry, he came in 1957 to be the principal of the school, the, the new black high school. And he is shocked and appalled at the conditions that are happening in McDonald's quarters. Um, at this point, to answer your question, he's saying there is raw sewage in the streets because these, these sewage lines aren't connected to anything. You know, there are animals like chickens and things just running around in the streets. There's garbage in the streets. Uh, mostly because there was no one to really come and pick it up like they were supposed to. And they didn't have the, the amount of trash receptacles that were necessary for a community of, of about 100 houses. Um, so it wasn't great conditions to live in. Now, when I want to take a pause right here for talking about the conditions, and I'll come back to them. But I do want to point out that even though they had these deplorable conditions that they were living in. This was a living, breathing community. You know, people lived here and it doesn't matter. I, don't get me wrong. It matters if you are living in deplorable conditions, but you're going to make the best out of what you have. So, you know, Macedonia church was there. There were restaurants, there were, there were nightclubs or, you know, as my mom would call it, a jet joint. There were restaurants, you know, this was an active breathing community. So it wasn't like, you know, people were just, you know, walking around, woe is me. People were working and, and living and making homes and doing, you know, everything anybody else was doing in the Naples area. You know, they were making do. And so, you know, if I if I take if I had any one big takeaway from the the story of McDonald's quarters is is the resiliency of the people who lived there and the enterprising of the people who lived there. You know, they made the best of a, what was really a tough situation. So to get back to it, you know, here we go. Nine, you know, in 1960 we, or yeah, when the construction um, association said we're not going to build this anymore. The city is aware of this problem. The city is aware that there is something wrong with McDonald's quarters. The city is not necessarily in a hurry to do anything about it. Um, so when Herb Cambridge comes here, um, he, by within a few, by the time he gets here, they built the River Park Apartments. So he lives, he's able to get an apartment there, but that is still a part of the McDonald's quarters. Um, I was a little confused about that, so I had to go back and do some research on that. But in his own words, that's, that's what he said. Um, but he's, he's able to live there. That's a part of it. But he starts, you know, trying to do something about this area. He approaches the city. They're not really big on it. Nobody really wants to do anything. He is not the only person asking the city to do something, to be clear. There are plenty of Naples residents who are seeing McDonald's quarters and saying, this is not okay. They are, uh, they are also trying to appeal to the city. Nothing is really getting done. The city's not really in a hurry to move. Um, but then some things change. In about 1975 or so, um, so we're now 15 more years later after her, after the construction, um, ceases, 
a new doctor moves to town. He, moved, he is working for the health department. And Herb Cam Cambridge approaches him and says, come check out McDonald's quarters. I want you to see the conditions down there. And you know, this doctor, Dr. Cox, says, OK, we'll send some people down there. He goes down there, he, or he sends some people down there, and they come back and they say, no. Like, people can't live like this. Um, so, you know, he writes a report. Yes, sir. If I may add, mm -hmm. the NAACP was chartered in this county around 1968, mm -hmm. at which time Mr. Cambridge was working with the Betterment Committee, mm -hmm. which included people like the Anthony's, as well as others. And they insisted to Dr. Cox and others that something had to be done. Mm -hmm. It was at which time the NAACP's charter grew from the Naples branch to the Collier County branch of the NAACP. And they forced that issue, and thus the reason why after the closing of the all-black high school here, that George Washington Carver apartments was built. All right. So we are moving to that. Mr. Carver, or I'm sorry, not Mr. Carver, Mr. Cambridge yes. was the president of the NAACP at, at the time. time. So I apologize for not making that clear I, that he was not working alone. Um, he was president of the NAACP. Um, I read something like the, like one of the, the Catholic diocese got involved. Um, the, I think the Episcopalian church, a, a couple different organizations got involved to try to, to try to make this happen. Um, Dr. Cox taught, went to the state health department who came in and was like, mm, you have to do something about this. Um, they approached the city. Um, the city, it gets a little fuzzy in there. And, and again, if people know, cause they lived it, it, it appeared that the city, they approached the city, the city first told Mr. McDonald, you have to come in and fix this. Mr. McDonald said, okay, we'll come in. I'll come in and do some things. Um, he wasn't exactly a, a swift mover and try and fixing these things up. He did do some things. Um, but what I, what I re read was that the NAACP um, approached the city with several solutions, including having the federal, having the federal government come in and provide uh, and create a housing authority and provide funding to build houses or apartments and the city turned them down. And that's what they asked for. They asked for the housing authority to be brought here to call your county. Unfortunately, the city did not want that to happen because that was a federal program. Right. So the and city so, turned them down. Exactly. And now, so in the process, they did happen to people and the NAACP raised over $80,000. I'm getting there. Yeah, I'm getting there. <laughs> that was the next thing. So, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. No, it's okay. It, it's absolutely okay because these, this helps me. But um, in, so in between the, the George Washington Carver apartments getting built and the city turning down funds, the residents of 
led by Mr. Cambridge and NAACP, the residents of McDonald's quarters, you know, said, we're going to try to do something about this. So this is why I go back to say this is really a story about their resilience. Um, they decided that they were going to try to build, clean up their own, this, this community, regardless of what the city was saying. And so they did, they raised $80,000, um, to connect the sewage, the sewers to the city and to clean it up. And they did all of those things and, um, they renamed it progress village. Um, in between this two, they sued Mr. McDonald. Um, and again, there were some efforts to clean up. There's a, a magazine back there, Neapolitan with um, Julius McDonald Jr., where he talks about the efforts to clean up. Um, it's an interesting perspective. <laughs> um, but you know, everybody has their own perspective. You know, it's his father and you know, everybody has their own perspective, but it's there, it's, it's informative. Um, you know, so there was, effort to clean up by the by Mr. McDonald because he was actually court ordered to do it because of this lawsuit he was court ordered and then at some point I guess he had cleaned up as much as he thought was necessary and the city came back and maybe the health department nudged him and said you have to do more than what you've done and he said well I'm done I'm not doing anything else and he walked away and the city purchased the land from him. And then this is how we start moving forward to what becomes George Washington Carver apartments. Um, again, with the efforts of Mr. Cambridge and the NAACP and some other people, they raise $770,000 to purchase the land from the school board where the old George Washington Carver High School had been, which was the black high school. I um, mean, they purchased this land um, in order to build the George Washington Carver apartments. So um, that's how we get those. And um, that's how McDonald's Quarter sort, sort of got cleaned up. And that's how it, you know, kind of, you know, it's the story of, of people come, you know, being able to, it's a story of survival, but it's also of endurance. Yes, sir. If I may add. You may. <laughs> I have to admit that the issue of housing mm -hmm. has been a long-standing problem. And the NAACP, along with the issue of education, has always been working closely together. It's very fascinating that we always have those two stories to go hand in hand. But police brutality has a tendency to go along with it. And so that's how the NAACP found its way here. But fortunately enough, for a man like Mr. Cambridge, mm -hmm. who was instrumental, he was working in the school system, he had a very good relationship with the politicians, the economic development of this town here. He had a good relationship with closing and ending discrimination under the Brown versus the Board of Education out of Tulsa, Oklahoma. And because the superintendent knew a lot of what he could do, and they knew they had to close that high school, it gave the birth, or should I say, he, instrumentally working with them, gave the birth to the apartment complex. Now, there was an association that came right along with it, but they did not want the housing authority mm -hmm. here in. And still to this day, we don't have them. That's very, <laughs> that, that was really program. interesting to me that they they turned down this much, not once, but a few exactly. times, exactly. Um, the opportunity to, to fix this simply because they didn't want to have a housing authority. Um, now, McDonald's quarters was officially condemned 
in night and, and torn down in 1981. Now I mentioned that date specifically because you know you a lot of people want to feel like this was re, a really really long time ago. You know this is a 30 year period of Naples, but I was born in 1981. I'm not even 40 yet, and so it's really not that long ago, and so. You know, and that's, you know, why I kept mentioning dates. I, Because typically I'm not a date person. Even even when I taught school, I didn't make my kids learn dates. I want them to know what happened. But in this situation, it matters because, you know, it wasn't as far back as people think. And that this was, you know, a 30-year period in Naples where lots of th changes happened in that 30-year period. You know, integration happened in that 30-year period. And still it was 1981 before you know, these, you know, McDonald's quarter was gone, you know, until, you know, there, this was a fully, I guess, resolved situation. I see your hand, Mr. Keys. Hold on just a second. Um, right before, I'm going to open up the floor for questions, but before that, two things. Um, in the back, there were, uh, there were some literature. Some of it has disappeared, <laughs> um, but it's, it's information like the report from the committees that, um, that Mr. Cambridge and, and Dr. Cox, they put together, they're, they're, the reports are back there. Like I said, the Neapolitan with the interview with Julius McAllister, McDonald, sorry, Julius McAllister is from Panama City. Um, <laughs> there's, you know, a, an interview with him. There are some court records um, as far as the decisions that were made about McDonald's quarters. So that information is back there. Um, as I said, we don't have near as much information as that I would love us to have. Um, so if you know someone who lived there or who experienced it, you know, please, we love, we have the ability to take oral histories. We'd love to see their, their photos in my perfect world in my vision, instead of a quick overview that I gave you today, um, we would be able to have individual talks about each community where we get to really dig into them and, and really, you know, dedicate an hour to that community and how it grew and, and how it's prospered and the people of that community, what happened to them, you know, where are they now, that kind of thing. So we would love that information. And really quick to Amanda Townsend. Hi, I just wanted to let you know, in addition to the information that Joyce put together back in the back table and what she shared with you now, um, we're, we're very, very lucky this evening to have on loan the original of Paul Arsenault's painting of McDonald's Quarters. And he got word that McDonald's Quarters would be torn down and, and painted this painting in plain air before it was torn down. So um, it is on loan to us from the artist and the NAACP and the friends of the county museums. So we appreciate um, being able to share it with you this yes. evening. If you get a chance, that is the original. And um, it's, I, I've told Paul this before, he has the ability to just know where, when it's time to go paint something before it's gone. His, he, he is uncanny. He's, he also has a painting of the Beulah Baptist Church in Copeland, which is also now gone. Mm -hmm. um, he just has a real knack for knowing when it's time to capture our history. And uh, um, it, it, I, I love the painting. It definitely has a, a, a Paul style and, mm -hmm. and, and, and possibly romanticizes McDonald's Quarter <laughs> some. Um, but, uh, um, but nonetheless, it's, uh, it's an image that's, that's real and, and, and you can't go there today. So uh, we're, we're, we appreciate um, the NAACP and the Friends uh, allowing us to display that for you tonight. And then very quickly, before we take questions, the Mr. Keys back here, who was giving us so much information, is still the current president? Yes? yes. Still the current president yes. of the Collier County chapter of the NAACP. So we're certainly grateful that he's come out. Um, and so you had something to say? So I'll give you the floor I, I really quick. I just wanted to add, and I think I don't, I apologize for being late. Oh, no worries. Uh, but to put things in perspective, let us all realize that our city did not become incorporated until 1923. Mm -hmm. 
So um, it was frontier territory at that time. So even though we've come a long way, or some may say, <laughs> but we history, yeah, history will uh, give you a snapshot, and I just think that is one of the greatest paintings that we could cherish, and the city has agreed because it has been a black eye on their past, but they have agreed to show it at City Hall. And oh, so wow. we, oh, wow. we are continuing to uh, push the envelope and develop the frontier. We have a long, long way to go. But we have this as a record, and thanks to the museum, they have done a fantastic job. So I want to take my hat Thank off you. to you for even bringing it forth once Thank again. You. So keep up the good work. Well, thank you. So we have questions. Putting aside the conditions under which they had to survive, there were birthdays celebrated there. There were children born there. Yes. There were people married there. There were happy times. People sitting around Thanksgiving tables. And that's what that depicts. Yes. And I don't think they would have got that if they had projects. Coming. No. no. This is a nice community that looks nice. Right. They had federally funded projects that it would not have been no. nice. And like everyone that. who lived there will probably, in their hearts, they have good memories. Apart from the conditions, they do have good memories in their hearts. Where is this, um, uh, the, Macar the Carver School? And, and, and where did the school go? Where's the uh, departments at? Near the rec center. The Carver School now is is where the apartments yeah. are. Yeah. I don't know where you now. Know where those are. Um, sure, sure you do. You know yeah. where they are. Tenth Street, uh, south of Fifth Ave North. Okay. So that's George Washington Carver Apartments, and then the school is where the current rec center is, which is Third and Eleventh. Do you know the rec center? There's they have a pool. And the River, River Park, Park Recreation River Center. Park. I'll have to ride my bike around a little bit more. Oh, it's huge. Yeah. It's a new building. Yeah. yeah. Are you new here? No. Oh. Yeah. Okay. No, it's a... It's I mean, I recognize the name. It's a the way. And the pool's been there since... I just want to know where it is. Oh, so the pool is... I'll take those bike yeah. rides around. So, <laughs> Frank Goodlit? You know where Frank Goodlit? Yeah, I know where, like, Water, Watermill Park is around there. Oh, no, no. You're far away from it. You know where the hospital is? Yeah, the hospital. It's Cross Forty One. What's really interesting about this is I have driven this area trying to figure out exactly what the parameters are and I never know. I'm the always best, just like, I'm not sure where I am. Where it is, is number one, do you remember when the Naples Daily News used to have its uh, old right. location? Yeah, right. Yeah. Right. Yes. That and that is yeah. exactly, it, it was right across the street. It would be really high from to the north. The okay, and right. so, and yeah. so if you, I should have brought the article because we had an article written in Life in Naples. And, and that is a downtown magazine. So, um, the editor who wrote for the Naples Daily News, Jeff Lyle, you remember that? Yeah. Jeff wrote the article that was in the recent magazine of Life in Naples, and it came out this summer. I should have brought it with me, but I, I, I apologize. Yes, it's, it's there for you to see. You can read it there. And it talks about the painting. There's a question over here. Um, yeah. so, go ahead. Either one. <laughs> I, I know that there's, it's difficult to thread it, but I'm just thinking of a snapshot of a, of a population size. And, and did it kind of absorb into each other? Did people go away for a while? Did they come back? What do you think happened in that regard? So actually, um, so when they did the survey, the, the Citizens Committee for the Elimination of City Slums, when they, they did a, a survey of the area, they asked questions. Um, and by, by 1975, 76-ish, they estimated that about 1,000 people were living 
in this five acre radius. Um, and when uh, the apartments were built, I think the largest one was a three bedroom. Yeah. There were so just, there, there were, bedrooms, two and three bedrooms. Mm -hmm. there were some families that were just too big for those apartments. They actually bust a lot of those families back to where they came from. Um, so a lot of families left town. Um, they were able to get basically the Greyhound company took them back for free um, to help them to wherever they were from. Um, because there was, there was no, there just wasn't enough housing for the amount of people who lived in, in McDonald's quarters. So did, does that fully answer your question? Yes, thank you. Okay. Did the Frank family own the sawmill there on Central? I don't know the answer to that. Like I, like I said, I, 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 like there would just be random references to the meal, but it wouldn't be the name of the meal, you know, who owned it. So I, what I know is that there were multiple meals and so I don't know who owned what. You're welcome. I appreciate it a lot. Um, is there a place where all of your research and other um, documents that are part of this Black History Archive in Collier County, is there a place online? And if not, can we try to make it happen? <laughs> <laughs> so we have a library um, right over here that by appointment you can come and look at um, our references and our resources in the library. Um, and you would make an appointment with our curator of collections. That's Jennifer Guida. Um, some things you can find online. Um, I've learned that it's all in the way you Google. Um, you know, you got to pick the, the correct words or nothing will come up. Um, like if you if you just put in McDonald's quarters in Naples, you're going to get a whole lot of articles about McDonald's and their quarter pounder with cheese. Yeah. <laughs> so it is all in yeah. it really is all in how you word things. And so um, which was, you know, kind of made it hard for to pull this together because I would go down rabbit holes trying to figure out, am I talking about the same place or, you know, I, I don't I wasn't sure. Um, but. So to, so to answer your question, there are some things online, like the article Mr. Keats was talking about is online. Um, so there are some things you can find. Um, there's also the, the clerk's office has some records um, as far as like court records and things like that. Um, it's, it's a lot of piecemealing. Um, but, but I would say that our library is going to be probably the biggest repository for that kind of information. I mean, digitiz digitization takes effort and, and time and money, <laughs> money especially. Um, I don't make those kind of decisions. Um, our illustrious director, though, is back there. Um, she could maybe comment on it. Any volunteers or high school interns? Or? Yes. No, I, I would be happy to speak to that because we would like to be able to digitize and have available to the public online our entire archive. Um, it contains tens of thousands of photographs and documents. Um, so what we're talking about is an incredibly daunting task, but it is not impossible. Thank you. Um, it is certainly within our strategic plan to make our archives more accessible. We absolutely do open our doors to anyone who wants to come here and physically research. You just need to make an appointment and we will accommodate you. It's part of the public service that we provide. Um, and as funds and time become available, we certainly will do more to provide access online as well. And Karen brought up cards. Our volunteer coordinator brought up cards for Jennifer Guida. So you can take one if you'd like to make an appointment um, and here. And then I saw another hand. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. I just want to ask. Now, they were having the, the school in the Markley, mm -hmm. and then all of a sudden with the Carver School. So had, what year did the Carver School go? How did that happen? Carver School opened in 1957, 58. George Washington Carver? Mm -hmm. Yeah. 57 or 58. Um, so they stopped busing them to Immokalee. Um, but then integration happened, so that changed everything. Oh, okay. And so how is it? Did Collier County actually integrate? 
Supreme Court said yeah. most of the South didn't. No, no. 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 It, it, it was 54 when the lawsuit right. was uh, uh, won. It wasn't until several years after it. Oh, I'm sure. And 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 Mr. Cambridge was brought here specifically mm -hmm. to deal with the segregated school here, and so. Um, one thing that I insisted on, because the history as it's told, a lot of times doesn't give credit to the accomplishments of people that had a great impact on neighbors. Mm -hmm. In fact, they'll tell you the story that we came as gardeners or as helpers, but a major impact that took place here in Naples was the arrival of that train. If that train did not come to Naples, guess what? Wouldn't be in Naples. Wouldn't be in Naples. That's very true. But there were people like Granville T. Woods who invented the steam boiler who brought that train here. There was Bird who 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 made the coupler to pull those trains together to get each car here. So not to mention what other African Americans were doing around the country in terms of patents. In fact, there was a black man who invented a patent right here in uh, Sarasota, in, in Bradenton. The, the cypress tree would not have gotten cleared for roads to be done from Sarasota to Fort Myers if it wasn't for him. So the impact that blacks were making all over the country was incredible. So I insist that nationally they tell the story. 1923, we were far in advance supplying information and doing things to make this happen here in Naples. Don't tell me about just the labor force that we came with because we came with a heck of a lot more. I do want to piggyback on what you said, and, and this didn't just happen in Naples. Um, it happened throughout the state of Florida. It probably happened in lots of places in Alabama. But when, you know, the decision for Brown v. Board came out, a lot of responses by some of the school boards were to try to keep schools separate, but to make them equal. And so when that happened, so you had schools all the way up to... Again, I was born in 1981, in Gainesville High School in 1980, didn't, didn't fully integrate until 1981 because um, they, built the, they, they built Lincoln High School as the black high school in Gainesville so that they would have equal facilities. They built a brand new high school after Brown v. Board so that they wouldn't have to integrate. I mean, it was a, a federal court order that said, if you do not integrate, you will lose your federal funding Weren't before they would do it. Period of time within which they had to integrate. There was a, a lot of them pushed it to the limit. There was a period of time. Maybe people, not. a lot Maybe of people not. pushed it to the limit. Like I said, a lot of people tried to build, set, or tried to upgrade the facilities so that they wouldn't have to integrate. They could say, well, they are they are equal, so that's all that matters. Um, so to go back with what you said, uh, or what you were talking about, that. Um, you know, I've read integration happened smooth, more smoothly here in Naples, but it depends on your definition of smooth, right? <laughs> if it, you know, if they waited 15 years to integrate, is it really that smooth? Uh, there was a lot of uh, sneaky stuff. Mm -hmm. Under the radar. Yeah, yeah, it was. And, and I came in the 70s and, and friends wanted to move down with us and they tried to find an apartment. I found an apartment. They couldn't find an apartment. Mm -hmm. I found the house I could have bought. But for some reason, there was no places to buy. So it was not over. It was more of a covert. Well, and one of I think one of the stories Amanda told me when I first moved, first started working here, was that um, 
Mr. Cambridge wanted to buy a home and he couldn't because no one would sell him property. And I don't, please elaborate. I'll take over because this is a fun story and it is an oral history that was told to me. I've never worked at to verify it at all, Um, but it is a fabulous story. And that is, um, if you if you do or do not know, we have the art studio of E. George Rogers. That's sort of our newest permanent exhibit here um, at the Collier County Museum. E. George Rogers was a community leader uh, in Naples in the 50s and 60s. He lived actually until 1992. He passed away at the age of 101. Um, and among other things, he was a big proponent of education. He taught art when there were not art classes uh, and insisted that if you were to volunteer to teach art, he would teach all of the children, not just at the white school. Um, And he eventually ran for the school board and was the chairman of the school board when they voted to integrate the schools. Um, And he was also a friend to Herb Cambridge. And the story that that E. George Rogers' daughters told me is that they knew that their father and Herb Cambridge were lifelong friends, and they did not know until their father's funeral in 1992, and Herb Cambridge stood up at the funeral and spoke and said that when he moved to town, no one would sell him a house, and he was living in Fort Myers. And Mr. Rogers asked him, why are you commuting from from Fort Myers? There are plenty of places to live in Naples. And Herb said, no one will sell me a house in Naples. And Mr. Rogers said, well, I will. And wow. according, according to what Herb said at, uh, at Mr. Rogers' funerals, the, 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 this is the story coming to me from his daughters, is that E. George Rogers bought a home and then sold it to Herb Cambridge so that he could live in town. I heard the same thing in one of the books I was reading from mm-hmm. the Bay Area. Mm-hmm. Nice story. Good story. Mm-hmm. Thank you. Mm-hmm. I saw another hand somewhere. Uh-huh. I think it was just me. I just quickly looked it up. So Dar- the Black High School in Naples closed in 1968. Mm-hmm. So that means it took 14 years for mm-hmm. them to. Yeah, now, right. and I know somebody who grew up here, but when he was in high school, he actually went up to Fort Myers in the 60s to finish high school at Dunbar. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. That was very common. Yeah. Was that Dunbar. was very common. Dunbar High School, yeah. Oh, to go back, how or Dunbar it, School. didn't the people who lived in McDonald Quarries have to pay rent to Mr. McDonald? Absolutely, yes, yes. yes. Oh, they, they had to pay rent for these homes, home for like, <laughs> lack of a better word. Yeah, I mean, what? How did he was. come in? To the picture. He built them. He, you know, he I mean, did he buy the property in the beginning? Yes. 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 He. Someone else owned what became McDonald's quarters. The, the, whoever owned the mill, that family burned, owned it. All those burned and mm-hmm. were available for sale. And so he bought that land because, all, you know, everyone lived at Ditch Bank and he wanted to develop that into what would become Creighton Cove. So that really made him a millionaire. Oh, I'm sure. I mean, he was already, I think, fairly successful when this happened, but, you know, there's never too much money, I guess. Any other questions, comments? Thank you. Discussion? Yes, sir. Are, are, are you going to discuss? where people are now? Um, you know, I, you missed it. <laughs> One of the things that I said was that, you know, we don't have enough personal stories. Um, we, we don't have them really at all. Um, and so what I hope happens from, you know, bringing this up as a topic is that people who have lived these experiences will come and talk to us and come and share those experiences with us. We can get oral histories. We can get well, photos because we don't have... You know, what we have mostly, I mean, we have a few photos, but we have things that are culled from newspaper articles and and from city records and things like that. We don't have those personal stories. Um, I myself have met Perlene Dixon, who came here this summer and did a talk. Um, She's still kicking it over by the library. (laughs) That's where she lives. And I met Vonsil Whitaker and her mom, Miss Mary Hill, last year. Um, I've read, met, of course, Reverend Clayton Hodge was here, uh, yes. but I have not met 
many residents, you know, well, I... There, there are a lot of them still here. Mm -hmm. yes. And in fact, when we sold that painting, there was an article written by Cynthia Cave mm -hmm. uh, that went along with it. I should have brought... Is that, the, is that the Bee in Black in Naples article? Is that it? No. no. Okay, no. there is an article that I read about that one, but it, it, it doesn't talk, it doesn't go into a whole lot of detail. Yeah, it doesn't go into a lot of detail, but there are people still in the area mm -hmm. who remember and live there. In fact, uh, I talk to Miss Cave very often, and her uncle is still alive and still living here. So um, people are available. You can, you can actually get first-hand information, but we just like getting this, you have to dig. And right. you have to really go out of your way to find, but it's, it's available to you. Well, and for someone like me, I've been in Southwest Florida six years, but I actually live in Lee County. Um, it's hard for me to even know where to dig, but you know, if you would like to help <laughs> dig, be glad to, be glad you know, to. we can be do glad this. Glad yes. You and then you. So um, they they raised the McDonald's quarters. Is that what they did, and what's in its place now? Then they built the the Carver apartments. No, well, no, 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 no. Oh, I got that wrong. No, no. I'm sorry. Yeah, I, I got that wrong. This, this is what I really want you guys to know. Wrong. It is absolutely amazing that piece of property, less than five acres, right now. They have built condominiums on that piece of property, mm -hmm. and literally. Literally, they're well over, I want to say, around 600 plus, okay? So, oh, I didn't that, know that example or that history right there is not so different from any history going on across this country. Well, and my understanding is that where McDonald's quarters was is in the old railroad turnaround which the city of Naples, when I worked for them, purchased using federal dollars, and that's where we built Jasmine K apartments. Mm -hmm. Carver was built on another parcel. It's all the same neighborhood, but the, the physical location, my understanding is where we built the Jasmine K apartments in the 80s. Okay. Or I, the 90s. Well, she's, I guess it would be a good resource for you. No, that's excellent. That, like I said, that, you know, this is me piecing together and trying to pull information. I'm like, okay. And, and like I said, there were times when I would have like three or four different things laid out in front of me that all described something different, but sounded the same. <laughs> and I was like, I don't know. The, I'll say, I'll say this, that the uh, <laughs> county commissioner's office is in the business of buying land. And so, as time went on, they have bought and sold land. The so, county commission or the city of Naples? The city of Naples does the same thing. I know the county does it all the time. So the city of Naples does the same yes. thing. The city, yeah, we but, purchased that land for the construction of the Jasmine K apartments. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And that and I was told that that's where McDonald's quarters had been located because mm -hmm. where George Washington Carver was built mm -hmm. was other city owned property. That's right. The city city still owns it, it and the company that owns the apartment complex pays the city a dollar a year to lease the land. The property that Carver Ranger Apartments was on was where the school was. So, the school system owned that land. Mm -hmm. They sold it to the, the, city, the city, and then the city and then had the, the developer exactly. build right. Exactly. So see, all of that, like, I knew about the purchase of the land and all of that, but those little did, details I couldn't, you, I couldn't when find. When you were researching, did you hear anywhere that, and I, because I wasn't sure about the time frame about when McDonald's quarters was raised, mm -hmm. but I was told that when I worked at the city of Naples that the fire department um, put 
uh, they started fires well, there as, practice. as right. practice for the firefighters. Mm -hmm. So they that's burned true. down McDonald's quarters mm -hmm. as practice yeah. for the fire department. But that's I didn't see that. They just did that. Yeah. They just did that to German uh, old yeah. old dealership. Yeah. 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 That's what they do cool the before they tear a property yeah. down. Uh, it goes to the fire department. They set them on fire. They do practice and what you call and then. Once it's yeah. down, and then, you know. I wonder if the um, wildlife What's management has been doing the same thing. Oh. Like when they start those fires on the windiest day of the year, which burns down the forest, and now they're clearing out the forest and putting up homes in all those areas. And so I think um, the Wildlife Commission planned that as kind of the same type of thing. There was all planned. Yeah. They started burning fires. You see, on, on, on 75, when you're coming before the exit off Alligator Alley. They burned the forest there. They burned the, the, all the way up towards um, Rattlesnake yes. Hammock and Collier, mm -hmm. and they let it burn. There was no fire trucks, nothing there. They let it burn. The news people were there as, people were, as everything was on fire, and there was no fire trucks. You know, and this is all from controlled burn. Yes, yeah, so the Indian the that started of the that year. That had, had centuries ago. They had no reason to be starting a fire. Well, well, well prescribed, prescribed burns are our yeah, thing in Florida. They do it all yeah, over the state. Yeah, yeah. on the windiest yeah. day of the year. But you have well, a question? Maybe the wind picked up and they didn't know it was going to pick up or something. I don't know. Do <laughs> 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 you have a question? Do you have a question? Do you have a question? Why they're necessary? I'm, I'm sitting here just free associating yeah. because there's a woman in town who came about 10 or 15 years ago and her name's Marina Berglund mm -hmm. and she is a film historian. She's done some documentaries, uh, something generic about the history of Naples, but she's a um, uh, a Jewish woman who is focused on Jewish history in Collier. So there's been a parallel pattern mm -hmm. uh, throughout time mm -hmm. to the black experience mm -hmm. and where people have been steered into certain neighborhoods, people have been closed out of you know, opportunities. So anyway, my thought is, uh, she's a friend of mine, <laughs> it's like, oh, I want her to take a meeting with you folks to see if, she's also good about going after grant monies to make these kinds of things. You've got this wealth of information here across the hall to be able to uh, do kind of a Ken Burns type of approach to it in addition to the, to the um, oral histories that I'm sure well, and she she spoke as part of our cultural series last year. Um, yeah, she was a she came here and talked about to us uh, did our lecture last year. Was that last year? I think it was last year. Um, and um, so yeah, I can't you know our curator of collections handles all of that. But, you know, part of my job is to disseminate information. Um, so I can't speak to to that for sure, but I will say that of course we do. You know, even in conversations with her today, you know, we of course want as much information as as we can get. We want to be the res a resource for our community a hundred years from now that they can come and learn about the history and culture of Naples and the development of Naples. Yes, ma'am. Who owns the painting now? I'm sorry. Who owns the painting now? It's. Who the friends who owns the painting? That painting was purchased by, by Mr. Friends of the Collier County Museum. No, by Friends of the Museum. Friends of the Collier County uh -huh. Museum. So the, yes. so the museum owns it, really? Okay. The, the, no, the oh, friends. Our, our friends organization. Okay. You had a question? You had a question? I'll leave it at that. Uh, oh, that's fine. It's not a private individual, at least it's in house. Okay. So, um, have you ever heard the Macedonia Men's Choir? I have not. Well, you, um, you have to. Yeah. <laughs> because I'm telling you, if you want to raise money, we need to make a concert and, of course, give the church part of the money. But that, they are the most famous, aren't they the best singers yeah. ever heard? Very good. Are you a member? It's a lot going on back there. If I, if, can I make an announcement? Sure. Sure. We would like to cordially invite you personally and everyone else to please come out to our inaugural literacy luncheon that's going to take place on November 15th. And, and it's going to be held at the Rich Carlton 
Tiburon Golf Club. It will take place from 12 to 2 o'clock. And one of the reasons why we tried to bring this kind of information to the community is because we believe by reading more and getting more involved that you will be more knowledgeable of the wealth of information that really is around you. So please, if you have an opportunity to spend lunch with Where? Dr. Patton, who is the superintendent of schools here, she will be bringing us up to date on the recent increase in state standards for our children to live under. And literacy really b begins from the cradle to the grave. And so I, I can probably introduce you to some folks who lived in McDonald's quarters, but unfortunately they still cannot read. Oh, oh wow. Fred, are you saying the NAACP is sponsoring this? Yes. Mm -hmm. it, that so, is correct. Okay, and so anyone that wants to go can look up at the either Facebook or on the website. On the website. Yeah, it's on the website. On the website. Okay. Omar went to get some invitation. But is the choir them. going to sing? Okay, very quickly. I did not realize it was 7:20, so time has gotten away from me. Um, Helene uh, has last comment, and then just a second, and then um, we can. You guys can converse afterward, but I'm finished. <laughs> you did a great job. Thank you. Thank you.